video ada. Okay, I would like to call the uh, May 27, 2020 budget to order at uh, 5.07 p.m. Uh, for the record, uh, will everyone who's present please state your name? We'll start over here. Zach French Dacus. Hello. Carolyn Stelter. John Langton. John Daniels. Jim Keeling. Okay, thank you. I would like to turn the budget uh, committee meeting over to Mr. Tim Keeley at this moment, our assistant superintendent for business. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, tonight we'll be taking our first look at the tentative fiscal year 2021 budget parameters. Um, we're going to start by doing a brief analysis of our financials year to date and it says of april 30th um, feel free to ask questions as we get through each section um, so when we get through the fiscal year to date analysis i'll take questions so moving through your slides um, we're going to look at our revenue first um, there's a year to date revenue dashboard and provided the board with uh, kind of a snapshot of where we were same time last year and as you can see um, our actual year-to-date revenues um, so far, uh, we're lagging about 2% uh, percent behind overall. Uh, looking at uh, the local revenues, uh, we're slightly behind. We can attribute that to a bit of a lag in student fees uh, during, uh, due to the current uncertainty of all things related to the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, and then when we look at the uh, state sources, uh, we're about 4.5% behind. Um, when we delve into that, we look at some different items uh, where we'd be expecting some revenue from the state uh, from food service sales that haven't occurred since uh, school was shut down, uh, as well as a reduction of transportation reimbursement attributable to the fiscal year 19 transportation invoices, you may recall from our prior contractor that were held over into the current fiscal year. So they were not reported to the state um, on that uh, reimbursement claim, they'll be coming on the future one. So we're a little bit short um, on this year's transportation reimbursement, and we'll see those funds come through uh, on next year's. Uh, when we, again, when we look overall at our uh, local sources, um, we're slightly better than we were this time last year. And then with state sources, we're about 2% um, behind um, the same time frame uh, as last year. And again, attributed to a uh, slight reduction in food service revenue as well as uh, the reduced transportation claim funds. Look at the expenditure uh, dashboard again, we've done the same thing. Provide you with a snapshot of where we were same uh, period to date last year compared to um, the uh, end of April uh, 2020. Um, our total expenses uh, we anticipated um, based on our prior five year trends to be about 72% expended. Uh, we can see we're at 75%. That's a significant increase, but uh, we attribute that to the fact that our summer 2020 construction, which is um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 million worth of work is uh, slightly ahead of schedule, although our construction manager won't admit it because uh, there are uncertainties with some of the equipment on order, et cetera. Um, the uh, construction crews were able to get going a little bit earlier this year. Uh, than anticipated and so we're about a month ahead in terms of expenditures uh, so we'll see a, a little bit heavier expenditures in the current fiscal year uh, for capital improvements uh, versus the 21 budget portion um, for the post july 1st work um, for salaries and benefits uh, we're very uh, close we're about 0.3 over um, same time last year we we're about 1.7 over um, and then again, uh, for other objects, we're about 9% ahead of where we anticipate in all of that construction, whether it be the construction manager professional fees, architect professional fees, or the general contractor expenditures, those are all uh, a portion of that number. Same time last year, we're about 6% ahead. Um, so again, about 3% effective uh, difference between uh, this period this year and same period last year. 
The next chart you are familiar with, it shows our fund balance as it trends throughout the year. You see our high point um, in September of each year, and then we hit the low point in May right before we get our June property taxes. Um, so this is showing that difference. Of course, this year, the budget does call for um, deficit spending, um, primarily due to the capital improvements. And you can see the fund balance trending slightly lower than last year. The next two charts so show the fund balance. Uh, the first one in relation to monthly expenditures and revenues. Uh, as you can see again, uh, if we reference back to the prior chart, you see that we're in kind of a, a downturn in terms of um, our fund balance that is typical um, based on our property tax cycle. So again, you see about 5.3 million in expenditures versus 1.7 in revenues. But we really look at this more on an annual um, basis. And again, uh, the 1.2 million in capital projects is significantly higher than what we would expect, um, but that is due to work being completed um, in advance of what we anticipate. And the next sheet just shows year to date, all revenues, all expenditures. Again, um, we've expended about 13 million more than revenues with the anticipation of um, the first portion of our property tax coming in June. Next, we have the aggregate financial forecast based on uh, months, months to date in the fiscal year through April 30th. Um, it shows uh, essentially a breakdown of what our annual forecast was uh, based on trends and our current uh, spend, as well as uh, putting the next door annual budget. And as you can see on the revenue side, again, we're lagging a little bit behind on local um, and then state also attributed to that uh, the categorical payments for transportation. And as far as federal is concerned, um, with the time that we set the budget, we generally don't have all the federal figures in those, um, in many cases, flow through. So while we're behind on the, uh, the revenue on federal, uh, we are uh, in a similar position as far as uh, federally funded expenditures. Uh, when you look down at the expenditures, um, you'll see that uh, we are um, underspending on supplies, and then um, we're tracking a little bit uh, higher on purchase services. That would be our construction manager and the architect fees, uh, mostly for the 2020 um, construction work. And then on capital outlay, we're about 1.7 million ahead of uh, where we expected the budget to be. Uh, but then again, that will show up uh, as a uh, reduction in the future uh, fiscal year as far as 2020 work. Um, expenditures concerned. Are there any questions about our fiscal year to date figures? Again, these are subject to change. Um, we're going to get into discussions on the 2021 budget parameters. Um, a whole lot of that is subject to change based on what we're learning every day about state and uh, uh, federal funding. Hearing no questions from the committee, I'll move on to our fiscal year 21 budget parameters. Um, this would typically be our second budget committee meeting, but due to the shutdown, we uh, did have to cancel our first meeting. So this is really the first chance for the committee to look at these figures. And uh, uh, from a personal standpoint, reflecting on this work, um, I, I am kind of glad that we haven't had that first meeting yet because so much has changed and so much will change even before we put the end of budget before the board next month. Um, the biggest factor that is going to play into our long-term forecast is the consumer price index. Um, this year, uh, for the, the fiscal year 21, our revenue is going to be based on that December uh, 2019 uh, 12-month CPI figure, which was 2.3. That's the highest we've seen in quite some time. Um, we've had an average of about 1.8 over the last 10 years. So that was very favorable. Um, Unfortunately, the last two months of consumer price figures have been negative and we're waiting for the uh, May numbers to come out on June 10th and we'll keep monitoring that. So we expect to change um, that fiscal year 22 number of 0% accordingly. Our hope is certainly that the economy uh, does recover, um, but we're taking a conservative approach uh, based on the information we have before us. For the out years in fiscal year 23 and 24, uh, we've moved this back up to 1.5% in anticipation of some economic recovery, and then back to 2% in fiscal year 25. Um, there have been ongoing discussions with our peer CSBOs in DuPage County, and, and I do feel like we are on the conservative end, but not by a whole lot. 
Um, there's not a whole lot of uh, good news as far as CPI is concerned. So as everyone remembers, that CPI is what drives, um, you know, it drives a, a big portion of our revenue. So uh, there are significant uh, changes in our financial forecast based on how that ends up. Um, for state funding, as I alluded to, we are uh, very concerned about the stability of the evidence-based funding model. Um, even prior to the COVID crisis, um, the model was uh, predicated on state funding. There was never a guarantee. There was, uh, in the law, there's a whole harmless, um, but that still isn't a guarantee that we're going to continue getting um, the base funding. Each year, we were planning on about $300,000. Uh, or more of additional tier funding as we move towards um, what they call uh, adequate funding. And uh, we've received word that, that we should not expect that uh, in the coming year. I will tell you that about two weeks ago, um, the talk from Springfield was there was a potential that we'd have a pullback of about that much. Um, so looking at a potential annual reduction of our evidence-based funding of about 300,000. Um, that does not appear to be the case. Um, but we will continue monitoring that as we move forward. Um, that assumption is baked into our um, forecast and does have a significant in impact over the next five years. Um, we are anticipating um, CARES funding that's listed there in your sheet. Uh, and we're working, uh, Ms. Cartman is working with our non-public uh, schools um, that educate um, the Addison School District for resident students um, to work through that application pro process as a portion of those funds potentially will flow to those schools. For now, we have a placeholder for it. Uh, my thought is that by the time we bring a final budget to the board um, in September, we'll have a very good idea on that. Um, we may have a more clear picture in, in, uh, in June for the tentative budget, um, but for now, again, we have a placeholder. We're looking at categorical payments at 100%. Um, and when I say that, that's, that's actually we're getting uh, you know, two from last year and two from this year, as we have the past couple of years. And for federal funding, we're keeping it flat, and we're going to do that on both the revenue and expenditure side uh, for the time of budget. And then as those grant applications um, uh, are approved and we get a clearer picture on that funding, as well as any carryover uh, numbers, we will uh, adjust accordingly. But as I stated earlier uh, in the meeting, uh, a lot of that really is um, offset by expenditures. So if we look at our assumptions for expenditures, as we all know, we have a collective bargaining agreement that was uh, ratified in the past year here. And so we're looking at 4% annual growth um, for the salaries. Before we move on, can I ask a question in the revenue area? Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, just in terms, okay, so if we were to just estimate how much of the money right now of our, our revenue comes from the state. I know we have very little in federal and I know most of it's property tax, but in terms of the state and how, uh, how much, what percent, 30 percent? It depends on the year, but it can be as much as 30 yeah, percent. So from memory, it's somewhere in there. And then the next payment would be sometime. So the fiscal year is June 30th. So we, we I guess what I'm getting at is at what point do we feel that the state, just like what happened in 2008, where they would just they didn't give us the money that we were supposed to get. Um, and what you, you get what I'm, my question is leading to, like, at what point do we need to start being concerned? about that percentage of money because it's going to happen. They're only going to give us 80%, 85%, 90% of that money. At what point do we need to start thinking about how the lack of revenue coming in? That's a great question. And at this point, we don't have any indication that um, that there will be a reduction of the evidence-based money. What happened in 2008 was it wasn't a reduction. They just didn't make full payments. They said, okay, we're going to owe you money. We're going to get that to you. And then over the course of time, we had to make adjustments based on, I mean, we did have the fund balance, but, you know, and eventually we got some of the money back. Yeah, and there, the state is still significantly prorating categorical payments. Um, for instance, when we have our conversations about transportation um, reimbursement, um, you know, in some cases, if you look at our total spend on transportation for regular ed expenditures, we're getting single digit reimbursement from the state. If you look back a decade, we were probably getting close to 80%. On special education, um, the understanding was always that that would be 100% funded by the state. And now uh, we're getting, uh, last year it was 65%. So it was 80% and that was uh, prorated again, a further 84%. So, you know, that's something we have to keep an eye on because our, our EDF money is 
the lion's share of our state funding. I have not heard anything yet about the state prorating that, but everything kind of hangs in the balance really with that state budget. Um, it's unfortunate that the state has this history of prorating. So your question is, is quite valid. Um, until we have further uh, guidance on that, we're going to plan on getting our base funding uh, and those come in, in uh, installments throughout the year. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor that. Um, and, and again, if, if adjustments have to be made, it'll be made in the final budget in September. So again, um, we've got our salaries there. You see uh, the figures that we're using. Those are uh, consistent with the current collective bargaining agreement. Um, with our, our benefits, um, with our health insurance, uh, we're looking at about a 6% increase based on our renewal uh, over last year. And then with our dental insurance, um, with our recent plan change, we see a slight up uptake above our, our normal um, and we're seeing about 10% increase. Um, beyond next year, we're looking at a 6% health insurance increase and in, in a 5% on dental. Um, for the Ed Fund, um, we are looking at a 3% increase uh, across the board with some adjustments being made, uh, certainly in the curriculum department based on uh, needs there, whether it be um, digital curriculum, textbooks, et cetera, as well as um, for student technology. Um, there's so much uncertainty right now for next year and what that's going to look like. So um, we certainly have to be um, as conservative as possible when we, we budget the education fund. And, um, you know, as an administration, we we stand ready to, to make adjustments based on the budget committee's um, direction as we move forward. For the transportation fund, um, due to the shutdown, um, we have, a, you know, obviously, um, some services that weren't rendered. So we're looking at a one-time reduction for both regular and special ed um, that's listed there in your packet. And those are conservative figures. That's that's not an exact. What we do is we look at <coughs> essentially what our daily billing rate is, and then I'll take about 90% of that, and, and we'll use that as a reduction. Um, there's the understanding that uh, later in the regular board meeting where we're, uh, the board is reviewing an amendment by our special ed education uh, contractor. Um, which potentially would result in future credits on that contract work. Um, the regular education contract is uh, uh, a year-to-year -year contract at this point. It's negotiated every year, and the board approved the contract earlier this year. That was a 10% increase, which is a very significant number, but when compared to our peers uh, and looking at other route rates, we're actually in a favorable position. So it, it's sensible to see that. Um, after the first year, we look at about a 7.5% transportation increase, which is um, a large number, but um, we are aware that many transportation companies are having significant financial issues. They're going to have significant issues bringing staff back in the fall, and that's going to impact everybody on uh, future contract uh, negotiations. Um, with special ed, we are locked in with SEPTRAN through uh, the end of the 21-22 uh, school year with 3% annual increases. And then we're applying that seven and a half percent thereafter. For the operation and maintenance fund, um, we did uh, apply a 3% increase, but with some selective reductions. Um, obviously with our um, capital improvement work, uh, we're gonna reduce some of the uh, capital, uh, internal capital projects that we're going to be doing um, to offset that. For the capital projects fund, uh, the numbers that are given there are, uh, uh, essentially what we've talked about with the BNG committee. It is a carryover from uh, last year's with the exception of that when we had this meeting last year with the budget committee, uh, we had not yet finalized the full scope of the summer 2020 work and had not uh, included the addition on the early learning center, which is about um, uh, $5 million worth of scope. So what we've done is we've carried that out through fiscal year 25, uh, which includes the summer 2024 work. Uh, and we've looked at about $5.6 million total. That includes construction manager and architect costs. Uh, as the board is aware, we've, uh, for the last, goodness, I think it was about 16 months, we've been uh, working with Leggett and our curriculum department um, to develop essentially the classroom of the future for our students. And uh, a lot of it has to do with the, the furniture um, and equipment in those rooms. Um, we're happy to report that um, the orders were placed uh, for the Indian Trail Junior High uh, Gen Ed classrooms, and they're expected to be delivered later this summer for our students to uh, students and staff to utilize uh, in the upcoming school year. 
looking at um, preliminary figures based on uh, some of the selections made um, by the elementary uh, furniture committee. Um, we're looking at a, a three year phased rollout of that furniture starting in summer of 2021 uh, and then for the next two summers thereafter. So that would be the 22, 23 and 24 fiscal years. Um, one thing I do want to uh, mention is that when we look at these, these renovation figures, these are significant numbers. Um, and really the only number that is set in stone right now is our summer 2020. As you can see, looking around our buildings, anytime you drive by, there's significant work going on. Those contracts, those bids were put out, contracts signed, and, and that work will be completed. Um, the 2021 and beyond are all flexible, and that's by design, so that if the unforeseen uh, hit to our revenue that that we're potentially seeing with this crisis, we can make adjustments to ensure that our operating budget maintain, uh, is maintained in a sensible manner. So I've done for the committee is I've provided three separate um, uh, projections. So these are typical format that you see from us. Uh, the first is a chart, um, kind of a graphical look at it. Uh, and you can see the um, fund balance depleting over time. And then the second shows the actual dollars that, that uh, uh, back up those charts. Um, the first of the three scenarios is exactly as I just stated to the board, uh, including all capital projects throughout that period of time um, with that ending fund balance down the bottom right in uh, fiscal year 25 of just over uh, $11 million. The second assumption uh, has us completing the summer 2021 work as of the current scope and then reducing future projects to $2.25 million. Um, and that's a total um, cost that includes the uh, professional fees from both the construction manager. Pardon me. So that's the second assumption there. And then the third that we've provided is completing the summer 2021 work, which is currently in the design phase, and then foregoing any future capital work outside of uh, what we typically do in the operations and maintenance fund. And that shows you that five-year trend. So we've got three varying, and these aren't the only three paths that the school district can take. Um, but my thought be, uh, was that we've got a very conservative, um, kind of a mid-range, and then uh, business as usual, at least from an expenditure standpoint. As we know, um, there's been significant changes to the revenue um, since this long-range plan was adopted. So with that, um, I welcome any questions the board may have. I have more of a comment than anything else, uh, as Mr. Daniels alluded to, with the uncertainty from the state right now on future funding. That could translate into property taxes at some point, too. Um, I think we have to really stay on top of this because I cannot accept having our fund balances by the year 2024 at the level that we're projected right now. I think that would put us in jeopardy and also put us in a position where we would have to be borrowing money at some point in time just to keep going. And, um, and I'm not saying make the adjustment now, but I think we have to work very closely with the BMG committee on this and some of these things. That you know, that's just my personal opinion on this. But, um, Right off the bat, you know, obviously things are different when we look back in previous budget presentations because we did put a whole bunch of work into this this summer. And and then on top of it, with the evidence-based model, we were anticipating a certain amount of money. And uh, you know, the one meeting I was involved in, they're taking away our tier two month funding. So um, but anyway, that's my opinion, personal opinion, John. Yeah, in terms of, let's just, let's go with the uh, project. Started work, how committed are we? Like a lot of capital projects is in progression. 
So how committed are we in terms of okay, if we wrap up this summer, we're looking at 11 million. We've committed to that. But in terms of the progression of our work, I mean, at what point can we say, okay, we're going to take a pause? You know, can we do that after the summer? You know, again, can we, I mean, again, we're installing maybe one thing to the next year. We're going to install the second part of that. I guess that would be pretty good. I know the second part might sound crazy, but you mentioned it. You can't have negative CPI in terms of affecting property tax. So like they can't say next year the CPI is minus a half and then our property tax revenue drops, can it? You've never seen it before. Um, we've been talking about it. You know, in, yeah, in 2008, we didn't see it, but um, you know, that's something that hasn't been addressed. I don't think the law would provide for that. Um, yeah. Because I mean, that, I mean, you mentioned it and I thought about it, if that were to happen, that we're going backwards. So by my figures, we're basically looking at a four percent increase of our budget in year at least going into next year, which is already already yeah. And if we're looking at some flat line kind of guys over the last three years, I, I really agree with Dave where I, I'm not saying that you want to have improvements, but you know, our salary is seven percent of our budget. 80 percent with with the benefits i mean so even if we start stopping the brick and mortar you know the majority of the school district is still people and you know i i think we have to start thinking so we don't have to well make hard decisions in 2008 there was some tough decisions i mean there's still a lot of things that don't like john daniel so i i just i mean i think we gotta have nothing to do with that i know no, so yeah, <laughs> a really good statement, and that's where I bring up to where where can we pause some of the capital projects? Not saying we won't do them, but there's so much uncertainty. That's that's where my question is. Well, certainly we have to finish this summer. Right, that goes without saying. Uh, the board approved the contracts with ICI and Leggett for 2021, um, so that work will. Uh, go on. No, so that's the part of the 11. That's contract. That's no, no, that, that, that would be the next, that would be the next year. So, so that would be five million. Correct. Right now. Right. Now, the question is as things develop between now and um, really say the time we bring a final budget to the board in September, we have to, the budget committee has to have discussions, the BNG committee has to have discussions, and we have the ability to significantly reduce that scope. Well, we have some contract. What about yeah. the furniture? We can make contracts with that because each year we're looking at close to a each year. There is no formal commitment on the purchase of that furniture. Um, again, uh, it, it's part of the, the good news of our strategy is that uh, we aren't in a position um, where we don't have things to cut. Uh, we always knew all along that the capital projects would come out of fund balance and that we'd be able to shut <laughs> the faucet off for lack of a better term. Correct. That's why we've done the things we've done in the budget. Correct. We, we, we save, we have a fund balance for a range of things like this. And, and you don't want to need this account. Correct. And you alluded to, to really one of the biggest factors. I mean, you know, when you uh, engage in, in um, looking at a collective bargaining agreement, you, you have CPI to look at. That's our main source of revenue. And so that's going to be one of the keys. Yeah, we can cut 5.6 million of capital projects you, out. You, you have a 1.5, 1.52. I mean, that's that's 5% over three years. Realistically, if history plays out, that that's I think that's still a little high, don't you? I mean, I think in 2008, it was like 0 0.8, 0 0.81. I mean, yeah. we there was a, you, you get what I mean. Sure. I mean, that's a little high. Well, we're going to have um, June, July, and August worth of CPI figures before we set a final budget. And that's going to be critical to see how quickly, um, you know, the, the economy does recover in that respect. But what's going to be critical for the budget committee and for, for the board as a whole is to really keep an eye on that operational um, budget. You know, the capital budget is kind of its own entity and it's being funded from operational fund balance. The concern um, becomes if uh, the conservative revenue that we've got plays out, then you are correct. In a couple of years, we're going to look at cutting some operational costs uh, because we don't have any control over that revenue. 
you know, we're kind of at that mercy. So while it's nice that we have the ability to reduce, we have, we have the ability to, to remove that, as you said, um, you know, almost a million dollars a year in furniture, um, over five and a half million in capital projects. Um, there's a there's a point here in the next couple of years, depending on um, how long we stay down in terms of CPI, that the board's going to ha have to make decisions on operationally. What does that mean? And I can't say what that is right now because again, we have that luxury of the buffer of that fund balance, um, but it, it certainly is not going to allow us to continue to invest in the facilities at the rate we are, unless there's some significant changes. Well, I, I thank you for putting the three proposals. I mean, just seeing the difference with, without the capital approval, I mean, it's like Dave said, it's it, it's shocking. There's a huge difference, huge difference. And the third proposal still includes all of the furniture, you know? So again, that is a capital expenditure that could we could forego. We could push that down the road a little bit. What's gonna be, kind of nerve wracking for everybody in the organization is if we have to start looking at making operational cuts. Okay. The teacher contract is three years, four years, four years. It's four years. So we have three more years after 4% per year. So that's another 12% increase on top. Woohoo. All right. Are there any additional questions? I have it. Right. Okay. Um, hearing none, is the motion to adjourn the Wednesday, May 27th uh, budget committee meeting? Second. Thanks, Tim and Beverly. Okay, at, at this point, um, we will be moving into our uh, regular board meeting. I would like to call the May 27th, 2020 meeting of the Board of Education Order. Will the secretary to the board please call the roll? Here. Yes. Here. 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 Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular session meeting April 29, 2020, as presented? So moved. Motion by Sir, second by Jim. Questions or discussion? Roll call, please. Daniel? Yes. 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 Motion approved. Is there a motion to approve the accounts payable for the month? May 2020 as follows. Education fund one million four hundred and forty two thousand one hundred and seventy seven dollars and thirty nine cents. Operations and maintenance two hundred sixty six thousand five hundred and eighty dollars and ninety seven cents. Debt fund zero. Transportation twenty thousand seven hundred and thirty two dollars and thirty seven cents. Municipal retirement social security eighty eight thousand forty two dollars eighty six cents. Capital projects fund two million one hundred four thousand three hundred dollars and twenty one cents. Working cash zero. Student activity one thousand three hundred fifty one dollars and seventy six cents for a total of three million nine hundred twenty three thousand one hundred eighty five dollars and fifty six cents. Okay, motion please. Motion by John, second by Jeremiah. Questions or discussion? No, it was answered. I was just, I reached out to John about um, some speakers that we had and uh, their use and I was just curious. Well, yeah, I'll expand. There was a speaker at Wesley. Um, it was something that had already been scheduled. So they switched it. So it was like a Zoom type thing for the parents. And, and I just thought it was odd being the fact that we're in remote learning, how we, we would have something like that. And I was curious. It worked out very well. Yeah. Was this paper that was already going to come to the school? Or it was. They had already scheduled him for this year. Ardmore School has used them twice. In fact, used them once earlier this year. And uh, so they still kept the contract with them, but it's expanded over the whole month of May. And it started earlier in May. 
and uh, is ending up, I believe, this week. And then there's going to be a follow up session with parents. When they did it in the past, did the engine will actually come to school? Mm -hmm. and yes. Show yes. Yep. Yeah. And they had, I don't remember the exact number. I had emailed that out uh, when I responded to Mr. Daniels. It was well over 100 participants. Now, was now in that situation, we did multiple schools just out of curiosity. Is there any way, if it's a speaker, where we could do a contract for multiple schools or the way Zoom learning work? Maybe he does one meeting and we invite all the parents to different schools. To so we, we did do that in combination with our um, neighbors in District 45, District 48, and District 88 when we had that uh, clinical psychologist do right. that session last month. That was very successful. Um, we are planning another one. In fact, Dr. Losey is working with, um, and I don't remember her name from District 48, to put on another session. Um, so th those are across school districts. Um, I don't know if they were, if the first one was. Uh, those guys don't like to tape it because if, then you don't really have to pay for future future meetings. The one from last. One from Wesley is taped. I don't know if the one that we did across all the school districts, I don't know if that one was taped or not. The one that we sat in on, yeah. I'm not sure if it was or not. No, I'm talking about if it was recorded while it was going on, so it's available for future viewing. I don't know. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Any other council questions? Oh, yes. 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 Motion approved. Is there a motion to approve the payroll for the month of April 2020 as follows? Education fund two million four hundred sixty-five thousand two hundred fifty-nine dollars and ninety-five cents. Building fund forty-seven thousand eighty-seven dollars and eighty-four cents. Transportation four thousand. $191.74 for a total of $2,516,639.53. Motion, please. So moved. By John, second by Serge. Questions and discussion? Roll call, please. Lane? Yes. 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 Motion I have not received any blue cards on agenda items. Um, we're down to committee reports. There was a land meeting on May 15th, uh, 2020. Um, that was a Zoom meeting. Um, I was represented by Speaker Dan Langton and Mr. Keelan. Uh, I believe it was about 55 people that were involved in it, superintendents, obviously, and board members from DuPage County. A majority of our meeting, well, not a majority, a big part of the meeting was talking about the evidence-based model funding uh, uh, disappearing, I guess you could say, especially for tier two, which we are tier two. And then the rest of the meeting was a, a bunch of, uh, I, I call them what is, because we don't know what's happening in the state. We don't know when the schools are gonna open up. And they said, well, what about this? What about this? And it was a good dialogue from all superintendents because had different questions and different perspectives on things. Um, I don't know if uh, John, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think you described it well, that there are a lot of what ifs that were discussed. The good news is now that the state um, has progressed with the state's budget, our next meeting, which is going to be scheduled, it's going to be a planning meeting in early June. I think that will be much more productive. Um, I also want to comment. Um, Mr. Williams was recognized for his longstanding service to the Lund organization and, and uh, congratulated and thanked. So uh, I also want to express my appreciation to Dave for serving. How many years has he been involved in Lund? I've been involved on uh, for the last uh, 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. 80. That was when I was on the high school board. So, Back in long time. And then I've been on the executive board for about 12 years, I think. Not anymore. Congrats, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. You represented our district well in DuPage County. Thank you. Um, and then, obviously, our other um, committee report was the budget meeting, which we just had. So I don't know if it's necessary to go to the report on that. 
Yes, sir. So I apologize in advance for the length of my report, but there's a lot to uh, give you an update on and give our community an update on. First and foremost, I want to recognize and thank everybody in our school district community who contributed to our remote learning program over the last few months. Uh, I have mentioned to our board members uh, prior to tonight that this whole experience has been very challenging and has been very consistent for our children. Uh, some children have done well with it, other children have not, but I still think we should commend the efforts of many of our parents, many of our teachers, many of our administrators, uh, many of our support staff who have contributed because we really did put a full effort into it, especially when you consider that it was kind of done at the last minute because it came, came upon us in such a quick fashion. So even school districts who had e-learning plans on file with the state, which there were only a few in DuPage County, those school districts still literally had to reinvent how to teach kids remotely. And uh, I, I've said it before, but I'm gonna continue saying it. I'm very proud of the effort that we put in, but we have a long way to go. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second. I also wanna congratulate our eighth graders and express my apology to them, although it was beyond all of our control. I think it's just awful that our eighth graders, our seniors in high school, our seniors in college, anybody who's finishing up an experience in an institution or in a school or an organization and moving on to end in this fashion, it's just really a shame. So we're gonna miss our eighth graders. We're, we're really proud of them and the work that they did. And we're gonna uh, do everything we can to support their transition to Addison Trail High School next year. And uh, we will see them again, that's for sure. Um, so the end of the school year is this week and it's bringing upon a whole lot of effort to uh, reconnect kids with their personal belongings that were left in desks and lockers and um, uh, uh, coat racks. And there's a, there was a lot of stuff that was left in our schools back uh, around, what was that, Friday, March 13th, I believe, um, was the last day that they were in school. And so this week, Indian Trail started the process, as you can see outside the doorway here. Hopefully you didn't trip on any of our student belongings in the hallway. But all week this week, Indian Trail's reconnecting our eighth graders, and then it's gonna be our sixth, seventh graders and sixth graders with all of their stuff. And then in two weeks, our elementary schools start the same process. So our principals have been providing very clear communication to our parents to make sure that they understand the process. It's done in a controlled fashion where everybody's wearing uh, masks and we're keeping social, respecting social distancing and uh, making sure that we make it as efficient as possible. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention to you, and I know our B&G committee was updated on this, all of our classrooms are packed. So our teachers did come in during the month of May in a controlled arena and packed up their classrooms um, so that we can get our summer work completed in our facilities. So uh, thank you to everybody who contributed to that. And it wasn't just one person, it was a, a team effort across the board. So what do we have next? We have a lot of planning to do. And as is uh, re revealed in the first item in my report, 2020-21 uh, planning, um, this is very similar to a communication that's gonna be going out to all of our parents this Friday morning. That's gonna be kind of an end of the year um, uh, note from me, along with giving them an idea of what we have in store and what we're looking at. So I'm gonna kind of cut to the chase and, and recognize that Friday, we're gonna be entering phase three of the governor's five phase plan for restoring Illinois. But what we don't know is when phase four is gonna come upon us or when the opportunity for phase five. And really the difference between phase four and phase five for schools is phase four means schools are gonna be able to open up again, but in a limited fashion. And that's what I'm gonna explain in a second. But then phase, phase five basically means there's a vaccine that everybody can go back to normal. And we don't know when that's gonna happen. I will tell you flat out our goal in Addison School District 4 is to get our students back in school, in-person learning as soon as possible. That's our goal. So what we do know is that there's three possible options. The first one is the one that we're hoping for is gonna be full in-person learning. 
Um, if we are able to accomplish that, that's going to be with some controls and some accommodations so that we make sure that we keep our kids and our employees safe. Um, we won't know that until we get deeper into the summer. Uh, the second option is what we call a hybrid model. And if I was gonna be a betting man, I, I would probably say that's probably the more likely situation, but we don't know. Um, and the hybrid model is gonna be uh, where we either split kids into groups and have them come in person for a portion of the week or certain days or certain weeks. And there's lots of different options that are possible. Um, and then the other times when they're not in school, they would be doing remote learning. And then of course, the worst option, which none of us prefer, is a full remote learning to start the school year. Um, I promise you, our Board of Education and our children in the community, again, my goal is to get our kids back in school in person so they can reestablish relationships, start engaging in real learning activities that are gonna help them grow and be prepared for the next steps. Um, that was an oversimplification of both three plans. I will tell you that my leadership team is meeting in June. We have a whole week blocked out where all of us are gonna be working on the intricacies of each of these plans so that when we are able to make those decisions, we will be prepared. Um, what we don't know, of course, is what the timeline is gonna be, but I guarantee you we will be uh, prepared. Um, one of the barriers that we have, Serge, did you have a question? But I'm just because I think we should consider an option four. Okay, what's that? My, my thought, it's just coming from me, but I think these kids really need to be in a classroom. So if this phase five coming from the state, somehow, let's say they determine it's gonna be, you know, I don't know, October. Why don't we start considering pushing the start of school year back instead of remote learning? We need to get these kids back in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think we should at least have that discussion, at least as an option for them, because it's just gonna, it's just too important for these kids to be in the classroom learning, Obviously, we're all learning and doing something, but uh, we, we know that this isn't what they need and they deserve. And if that means start a little late next fall and then going a little later into the summer, I think that we owe it to the kids and we can consider, you know, cutting cutting some of those days off and making them, making them up for classroom time. That's just me, uh, but I really think limiting it to three, knowing that there is a phase five or there better be a phase five soon enough, we should at least be ready to say, listen, they think phase five could be phase five could be end of September. Why not just push back to two years? That makes sense to me. If we were able to get that information soon enough. And I the timing on it is is but why can't we be proactive and contact you and push it back anyway? I will tell you that I do not believe that our union will be a barrier in any way. I, we have had really. So we're starting after Labor Day, Labor Day now because of the construction. Correct. So September 1st is the first day of school, which is to our benefit, if you think about the time. So if we were to look at vacation days during the school year, holidays, some of those Mondays, institute days. Yep. I mean, we, we could potentially now, by the next meeting, push the school year back to September 22nd. That's could, still two, three weeks. We could make that decision, Mr. Daniels, in August okay. as a board of education. Well, you just said that because yep. you don't know what the future has, that you, you don't know, but I'm, that's why I'm asking. Correct. I believe that the three options that we're studying literally across the state, this isn't unique to Addison School District 4, are going to have to have accommodations based on the circumstances. And I agree fully with Mr. Ruffalo's um, uh, suggestion that if we found out that phase five is in the near future and we're going to push back the start of the school year i would not hesitate to support that but, and recommend but, that to the board but even if we push the school year back and we start in stage two with the hybrid it means less of the hybrid yeah because eventually you hope for a change and get the phase five correct I mean, we're not going to be in phase five i mean by then anyway yeah, and we don't know. Mike, I will tell you my biggest concern, and I have been um, the, the most vocal superintendent probably in the state of Illinois regarding 
the issues that any of these options other than full in-person learning will cause our families. Because I, I am really concerned for our parents who need to go back to work and once society starts opening up and they can go back to work, the last thing our parents want to hear is that we're doing remote learning or we're doing a hybrid model where my kid can't go to school five days a week. What are they going to do with their kids when they have to go to work? That's my biggest concern. And I think it's legitimate. All of my peers agree with it, but I'll be honest with my board. Everyone's like conveniently forgetting about that. Every conversation before that conversation ends, I bring up and my peers start smiling because they know what I'm going to say. We cannot forget about our parents who have to have a place for their kids. So I encouraged Lend, I've encouraged um, the ROE, I've encouraged the health department to well, keep so it can, yeah, without, a, without a doubt. And it they, does impact our staff because they have their own kids too. Yeah. Can we start the conversations with the union now about pushing the school year back? We definitely can. Absolutely. And I think it's a good conversation to have. I really, and I, I would even ask Donna, because Donna um, and some of our other administrators have met weekly with our union uh, regarding- I'm, I'm gonna say this to you, the teacher, I'm a teacher. Be part of Sometimes, yeah, you don't think it's gonna be a problem until it comes to that moment, and then it's like, well, what can we get out of this? I'm not saying in a bad way, in any way toward union, I'm trying to, I'm just saying that I'd rather start the discussions now and have them in the process so we know if there are hurdles then wait till August and be surprised by, I'm, I'm just saying that. I don't, again, I'm not saying there will be hurdles, yeah. but I'd rather have the plan in place and say, like Sir said, October 1st, we know in July that that is phase plan four. That's, that's all I can yep. say. So would we then potentially still have the same end of school and we just chop off days to make it this okay. that's a decision the board would have to make well, there's a minimum I, what, days, how many days we well, have to have students in session 176 days First semester right. catholic school is like 120 right yeah. so uh there's no requirement for catholic okay. schools so oh. but but the the start date and the end date fully lies with the local board of education okay. we do have to have 176 days days of instruction and we would most likely have remote learning days if there were remote learning days mm -hmm. count as days of instruction it's not guaranteed yet but they're saying that that's very likely okay okay so any other questions regarding planning for next year well would we be able to adjust our christmas break our spring break instead of having a full week of all spring of break through like 14 you know, i'm just is, saying that would be days but all of it is possible i agree with your suggestion that we should talk with the union about it to make sure that they are supportive of that flexibility. But again, I'll restate, that's the Board of Education's decision on the school calendar. Okay. And we can, even if we approve the calendar, which we have, and we submit it to the state, you can always amend it. Okay, I but, didn't, that's good to know, I didn't yep. know. Yep. So we go to 300. Um, the yeah. other thing that I want to inform you about is uh, our team, our administrator team, um, met with a representative of the Regional Office of Education, Dr. Yvette Dubiel, uh, back in February to learn more about um, equity and, and looking at our schools through an equity lens. I believe that this is um, something that we should have as a priority for our school district. So we're making sure that children and staff understand the importance of accepting others, uh, treating people um, with respect, um, and uh, it, it has to be part of the culture. So I have asked Dr. Dubiel to do a short presentation to the board at the meeting to help um, kind of guide this, because I do think that you're an important part of the support of this. Um, these efforts, um, if we decide to go forward or move forward with what's called an equity audit, will give us an assessment of our school district and our practices um so that we can grow and learn so i wanted to give you um, some advance notice about this um dr uh, carrie cartman and i did review the presentation that dr dubiel would go through with you and uh i'm looking forward to it i think it's going to be informative for you and for our community okay and then uh, we did have one freedom in freedom of information uh request 
and that was included in a weekly update earlier in May. Any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on, Mr. Chief, we have some additional information for us. Absolutely. Want to provide a very brief update on uh, the facilities. Um, later in the discussion, we'll we'll look at some um, uh, photos from the construction. I'll provide a brief verbal update at that point as well. Um, but certainly, um, our internal facilities staff, led by Mr. Dirk, are preparing for whatever version of school um, may await us in the fall. Uh, this includes uh, attending um, learning sessions, seminars, and doing research, uh, collaborating with ABM or custodial uh, contractor as well uh, to develop procedures to ensure um, that we meet the expectations um, that are put out there uh, for, again, whatever version uh, that looks like. Uh, in addition, uh, they, they got a little bit of a head start on some summer work uh, in terms of doing preventive maintenance. Uh, they've been tasked by the Buildings and Grounds Committee to uh, develop a comprehensive accounting of all of our major systems, along with a strategy for um, doing ongoing preventive maintenance and staying on top of that. So that's in progress and uh, we're excited uh, for them to kind of have unfettered access to the buildings and, and get this important work done so that when we resume whatever form of normalcy we have, uh, the facilities are ready. Again, for construction, uh, I'll just echo that, you know, we are uh, slightly, um, uh, the construction manager at ICI, they don't like to hear us say we're ahead, but certainly um, the weather and the lack of uh, occupants in the buildings have put us in a favorable, favorable position to meet our August deadlines for final completion. Um, and then our 2019 construction is finally nearing an end uh, with the completion of the exterior signs. Some minor punch list work. Uh, we had a call this morning with them and Certainly our hope is that uh, we're, we're making our final payment at the next board meeting to close that out and, and be done with those folks. Um, we're all motivated to get that done. We're, we're really pleased with the outcome. Appreciate the patience and support of the community and the Board of Education. Um, our employee benefits open enrollment. Uh, this is the first time we did that completely virtually uh, and it was a success. We certainly thank Gallagher and the EBC um, Insurance Cooperative for their assistance. Uh, every year we hold an in-person um, kind of Q&A and we have laptops uh, for staff to do their enrollment electronically with uh, Ms. Callip from the business office as well as um, the EBC reps. Uh, it looked a lot different this year, um, but had the same impact. We, we had a very positive um, experience with that and uh, did not have too many phone calls to make on the last day of open enrollment. And I have yet to hear of anyone that, that missed the boat this year, which is a nice change from years past. Um, and then uh, last but not least, I'm sorry, one more time. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, it's interesting because it is a benefit and, you know, I feel like we're selling something uh, because there are just so many phone calls and, and even Mr. Langton gets on the horn uh, and calls a few folks that, that we see. And we, we monitor it up to the last hours of the enrollment and, um, you know, even the last weekend, even though the enrollment has been, uh, you know, advertised for weeks and weeks on end, we still get calls. Wait, what's my password, et cetera. So, you know, we roll with it and, and we know that everyone, especially this year, has so much so much going on in their lives that they haven't had uh, to contend with in years past. And so um, we're pleased that that went uh, fairly smoothly. Yep, thank you. Um, and then last but not least is our meal distribution. Again, something we've never done before. Um, and, you know, it's like building a ship while you're out at sea. And Gina Grabowski and our friends from Arbor did a phenomenal job. Um, later in this meeting, if I can just riff a little bit, um, we're going to look at an amendment for our bus contractor uh, for special education. And, and from uh, almost the moment that, that uh, Governor Pritzker shut things down, um, we've had, you know, these open hands out from these, these billion dollar corporations that transport our students every day. Um, and, and, you know, they, they use the word partner a lot. And I just have to give a lot of props to uh, Arbor. They're a small local company. Um, they've got roots here in the community. And, uh, you know, not once have they said, hey, how are you going to pay us extra? Hey, how are you going to help us out? We're, we're losing profit. Um, it's always been, how can we help more? How can we help more? 
Um, thanks to District 88 and Ed Hoster uh, and their uh, contractor Chartwells for partnering with us on that. And, uh, and again, uh, Gina Grabowski in our office has been um, here every day and working on that and making sure that the communications are in, uh, you know, multiple languages, it's clear, and that we're, uh, you know, that we're meeting the needs of our community. And so that's going to continue into the summer um, with uh, once a week distribution of five meals and certainly hope that our com community continues to take advantage of that. And uh, we're just so proud to support the community. Um, Correct. Yeah. Wells and Arbor. Yeah, even to the point where um, uh, Mr. Hoster was able to secure some equipment from the food pantry and we're installing it at Fullerton and there's gonna be D88 staff doing distribution at Fullerton so that we're hitting all the geographical spots. So um, it is not perfect. Uh, and I know a couple of the Tuesdays we've been handing food out, it's been rainy, uh, but everyone's kind of, like I said, we cannot, that's, that's one thing we can't. And so. So since Mar since March, when we start or early April, when we started this between district 88, district four, district 45 and 48, the four school districts combined have uh, delivered over 250,000 meals. Yeah, there's, there's, they're almost all running out. Yeah, and it's a break, it's a breakfast and a lunch daily for five days a week, and they pick it up. So they pick up ten meals at once for the whole week. Uh, yesterday, we delivered uh, twenty meals because we're not going to be open next week. So we gave them enough for this week and next week because the next week is we're going to start up for the rest of the summer. So we took one week off to kind of rejuvenate things and give Arbor an opportunity to and chart walls an opportunity to refocus through the whole summer. Correct. It's remarkable. Yeah, and I, I think we should also give a shout out to the Addison Food Pantry. They have done incredible work for this community. They've been um, really, I, I think um, compared to other food pantries, they've risen uh, above everybody in the DuPage area. Yeah, we're, our, our community is very fortunate to have them. And John, are we tracking um, exactly how many of our District 4 students are taking advantage of these lunches? Do we have any of that? It's really hard because, uh, um, you know, the, the guidance from the state of Illinois was we had to feed any child up until 18 years old. Yeah. And so we agreed um, through the work of Ed Hoster and Tim Keeley we agreed to that district four was going to man uh, and be responsible for Indian trail in Lincoln, those two distribution sites. And then Addison trail or district 88 was doing sites at our other elementary schools, most of them in Addison trail high school. Mm -hmm. So what they're going to do for the summer months is we're going to pare that down to only two sites. We're going to be responsible for Indian trail and district 88 is going to be responsible for Addison trail. And I think they're considering one other in Fullerton. So, so Fullerton. yeah, and by, but by nature, uh, the summer meal program, which we've done in the past, certainly didn't have nearly uh, the popularity of this year. Um, by nature, that program is a community feeding program. So uh, it's it's assumed that you're a resident of this community. Uh, no IDs are checked. It's not tied to a student ID like during the school year. Um, and and frankly, it's it's essentially those in need uh, that come. Uh, the contractors track the number of meals and then that flows through state reimbursement. Thank you. And that concludes my report. The question for Mr. Keeley. Question. Um, with all the rain that we've been having, has there been any major damage at any of our facilities? Or are we, are we floating? No, nothing, nothing uh, beyond what we typically see. Got a couple of roof drains overflow. Um, we we're able to react pretty quickly to those. Certainly our facility staff, when there's a big event, um, they're going and, and checking those buildings. We do have obviously second shift custodial on staff as well, uh, but nothing, you know, aside from some of the uh, insulation at the ELC Ardmore um, construction site, a couple pallets did float down the street. Um, as funny as that does sound, obviously, we can laugh about it because there's no damage or loss or injury. Um, no, we've been very fortunate and uh, uh, the facilities have held. Anything about 
financial issues over at Wesley School since my email. I have not heard any follow up from the village on that. No, the only thing we saw was that the one day when it started, the um, uh, it, that, that big field south between Friars Cove and the school drained very quickly. They opened something up and it drained very quickly. Well, my concern is this, uh, I've seen this happen a few times. I know these rains are supposedly, you know, it's once in 10 years, once in 20 years, but this has happened a few times. And I know we've put a lot of money into um, the parking lot over at Wesley School. And I've seen that parking lot underwater at least four times in the last two years. And water does some major things to asphalt. So um, I think we just got to kind of, I know we're used to it over there because it was built basically on and on. Yeah. Um, but we really need to probably have constant conversation with whether it's the county or the village. And I know the village has been very active as far as responding to us. Yeah. Um, I know the community, I had a few members talk to me about it, but I, I pointed out it's not even our property, um, but uh, we, we definitely are concerned, obviously, for our neighbors and for ourselves, because that water was right up to the door that first time, and then last Sunday, it was up pretty close to the, to the door, so um, and that's that's my only concern area, because somebody else has got that to do about it, the other schools. I will I will reach out to the village and get an update and ask them what can be done. Thank you. Yep. Any further comments, questions? Okay, we're on to the value of the apartment. Mr. Payne. Thank you. Um, our teachers, we have our remote learning with students. Learning with students. They're still continuing to push out daily assignments and um, providing, providing that ongoing that feedback to families as needed. Um, we, we also can support staff by providing, providing opportunities for, for like collaborating and professional development through an internal support system as our construction specialists and external, external support as well. So that's going well. Um, just wanted to make you aware that students, SLPs, uh, uh, will email you for a trimester and they will be available through the portfolio option and be able to access beginning. So that's next Wednesday. Uh, we also, in order to learn from this experience, we have a survey available for parents, teachers, and our prior educators just to provide feedback on our current processes that we have in place in regards to remote learning, offer suggestions for improvement. We definitely are taking a look at this information, um, the survey results, and um, keeping all this in mind in case we need to. Um, uh, better our process for potential future needs. Hopefully we won't need it, but uh, we will definitely be taking all that into consideration. Um, as Mr. Langton shared, um, to all the uncertainties, we um, continue to um, make plans for what the fall will look like and we'll keep it posted as we hear more from the um, regarding their guidelines and what we can do. Um, to make, make you aware, aware that you can well and against the summer is continuing with their summer reading program, uh, the one, one book, book, one school, and the book chosen this year is Ghosts. So students are able to choose that title in English or Spanish. And uh, this is really possible to our title, title one funds. Our, our language arts partner, Indian Trail, are really looking forward to having conversations with students in the fall about this book and doing some activities that are related. Um, these books will be distributed during, during Pro 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 some of them, some of them are thinking about the supplies at the elementary building, fifth grade, and then for our Indian churches that start today. I think it started today, right? This week. So they're getting those books as they come through. Um, as you're aware, over the course of this past school year, our math, uh, math committee reps have been piloting. Uh, various math resources that have aligned with the learning standards. This year, they piloted uh, three resources. They, they piloted Big Ideas, Envision, and Reveal Math. The team has determined that Big Ideas and Math offers the whole resources for students in English and Spanish, and has an online platform that is friendly and offers a multitude of learning opportunities through videos and interactive work. So in addition, teachers can access teams across grade levels, so students that are accelerated, they can 
move up as soon as they see additional support, they can move down. Um, and these include the uh, six year license to digital, digital and materials, materials from our general education classes, our dual language classes, our accelerated classes, classes from algebra, and some of our special education classes will be um, utilizing these resources. So later this evening, we'll make a formal recommendation for the purchase of Big Ideas Math as the primary resource for our students. That's all I have tonight. Questions, please. Thank you very much. Action yes, sir. Our first action item is the acceptance of resignation requests. So we have three individuals on this list. The first one is Christina Dvorak. Second one is Marissa Lentini. And the third one is Julie Perez. I recommend those three as those three resignations as presented. Is there a motion to accept the resignation requests as presented? Motion by Sir, second by Jeremiah. Questions or discussion? Roll call, please. Ruthal? Yes. Adams? Williams? Yes. Daniels? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Lynn? Motion approved. Our section, second action item is the approval of employment requests. We have two individuals. We recommend that uh, Lillian Oliveira, uh, a dual language teacher at Indian Trail, and Iris Velazquez, dual language teacher at Army Trail, hired are hired as presented. Is there a motion to approve the employment request as presented? Motion by Chairman. Second. Second. Second by Zach. Questions or discussion? Roll call, please. Thomas? Yes. Williams? Yes. Daniels? Yes. 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 Motion approved. Our third action item is the approval of a updated job description. So within your packet are two job descriptions, the old job description for the director of business and employee services, and then an updated one, which accurately reflects what the current person is doing. This is uh, Milton Kalick, who's retiring at the end of June. I recommend the job description as presented. Is there a motion to approve the director of business and employee services job description as presented? Motion by Jeremiah, second by John. Questions or discussion? The position? Yes. Yep. Because we had a vacancy. So I would like to have a discussion the four people that are in there. Uh, I, I can tell you that compared to school districts, other school districts, large, small, similar. I also think, Mr. Towns, that a job description gives an overview. It's not a detail. So even uh, Diane Janokas is retiring when we hired her replacement, and I looked at that job description again, and I made some revisions to it. It had more detail, but it still is not inclusive of everything that Diane does. And I don't think any job description possibly can. I can tell you, I can tell you with all honesty that 
Um, our entire district office team works very hard and they're efficient. And my fear is even if we hired a new person to replace Melba, who doesn't have those experiences because she is so efficient that that person is gonna be overloaded because of the unique aspects of her job. But Melba didn't have those experiences when she took over the job either. Mm -hmm. so she actually had professional business world experiences before we even hired her as a health I clerk. Um, actually, I think they were, they were harder. She, she had yeah. very good experience when she I came to us. Yeah, in, in my opinion, we already operate very lean, very lean. If we had fluff, it would be easy to come. Everyone has done more with less, and we prudently the future with more with less. And there's the possibility that you're right, and we can't but I think we owe it to ourselves and to the taxpayers to dive into this. And I agree with you that we owe that to our taxpayers, which is why my entire career, in the, at the dis, especially at the district level, whether it was in Chuck's job or my current job, I have spent all of those years making reductions and efficiencies that have improved our bottom line. Uh, I'll remind the board that uh, it was probably about 10 years ago, we cut $3 million out of our budget. And the only place that we increased after that point was in the teacher ranks. We didn't add administrators, we didn't add district office personnel, we didn't add in our facilities department, we didn't add in our technology department. Only in those licensed positions that have direct contact with kids have we made increases. In fact, in the business office, and I, I'm not gonna say the number, but I know we made reductions, it was either one or two. Um, so, but technology, but technology 20 years ago, correct? We, we definitely do. Yes, we do. And, and Yeah, which is so why about this. If, if someone that has small business or 30, but my concern is we have a 50 million, roughly a $50 million budget. We serve over 500 employees and obviously we serve a lot of students and one position that efficiency could have a, a significant impact on our performance and the work that melba does involves and you have the job description critical components it's kind of like um if you make a mistake with payroll you've got big headaches um and and i revealed to you that Mr. Keeley and I did do a deep dive in automating payroll. And what we ended up getting an estimate from a company, it greatly exceeded what our personnel costs are for, the, for those tasks. And they even said, of course, you still have to have somebody on staff to manage it. And that would be a challenge. So I'm not sure where you want me to take this because our intention um, certainly was to replace Melba, um, not to replace Melba, and to go back to the drawing board. If we had fluff, I would have already recommended that, but I don't see where the fluff is. And I mean, I certainly could defer to Mr. Keeley because it is his department. Um, Mr. Wartman and I did talk about that, and I'm sorry he's not here uh, tonight. And he said to me, he's like, where are we going to make cuts? We've, John, we made cuts 10 years ago. So... And if I can also add, you know, that position is not, I mean, we talk about the business office, but 
you know, the reality is that Melba serves two departments. She serves human resources and the, the business office. So, um, you know, there's, there's, it's a little bit more than just the business office and certainly I have no problem having a more extended conversation, but I do want to make that clear as long as we're having the conversation that this, this doesn't just impact the business office. This doesn't impact personnel services as well. Action item is, and I would suggest that we possibly set up a, a, a John, please review it. I mean, you're sitting there just basically uh, debating Jim about it, and like you will look at it. Well, I would appreciate it if you would look at it. Uh, we will look at it though. That was fine. Roll call, please. Williams? Yes. Daniels? Didn't we say we were tabling it? Well, I thought you said no, that. It's, it, all it is is the. the just a okay, the I apologize. Yes. 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 Our fourth action item for this evening is the annual reappointment of the school treasurer and renewal of the treasurer's bond. So as is included in the action item from Mr. Keeley, I am recommending that we uh, continue uh, Mr. Keeley as the school treasurer and assign the treasurer's bond to him. Is there a motion to approve the reappointment of Mr. Tim Keeley as school treasurer and renew the treasurer's bond as presented? So moved. Motion by John. <coughs> discussion. Roll call, please. Daniels. Yes. 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 Motion approved. <coughs> Our fifth action item is the approval of the special education transportation contract amendment. Uh, Mr. Keeley. Thank you. So I alluded to this earlier in the meeting. We discussed this at uh, I do believe the March and April board meetings that uh, since the uh, start of the uh, crisis and the shutdown of uh, in-person learning, uh, the bus companies have been in uh, dialogue with the administration. Um, the administration and the board have been very clear uh, with our vendors that um, any uh, agreement or amendment to our existing agreement that we make has certain stipulations uh, in it. Um, the amendment before you is the amendment to an agreement uh, that was approved by the board in March of 2019. It's a three-year agreement. And uh, those stipulations uh, not only include that uh, SEPTRAN pay back the district any and all funds that the state does not reimburse through the categorical um, uh, transportation uh, reimbursement process, uh, but also uh, includes a stipulation that they provide us with uh, a complete accounting of all uh, funds that are remitted to them during the shutdown uh, time uh, that where they're not providing service just to ensure that it is flowing to the intended um, places such as uh, driver pay um, and and uh, getting ready for the upcoming school year. Uh, there will be a reconciliation uh, no later than December 31st of 2020 uh, according to the agreement. Certainly our hope is that there's some clarity well in advance of that. Um, but uh, without further ado, I do recommend that the board approve the amendment to the special education uh, contract uh, for transportation with SEPTRAN as presented. Is there a motion to approve the special education transportation contract amendment as presented? So moved. Motion by John, second by Jeremiah. Questions or discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. Yes. William. Yes. Yes. Motion approved. Our next action item is the approval of the purchase of math materials for uh, our middle school. Mrs. Haney, could you review that, please? Yes. Yes. So, based on my report earlier this evening, we okay. recommend that the Board of Education approve the purchase of our senior math materials in grades six through eight for the cost of $129,000. 
$1,875 to be paid in installments. The first installment of $1,000 will be paid using Title I funds. And this second installment of $75,775 to be paid using fiscal year 21 local funds. These costs include materials, digital and print, and professional development for each of the six years of the contract. The six-year option is attractive as the cost of a one-year contract is $134,288. We respectfully recommend the Board of Education authorize the administration to proceed with the purchase of Big Ideas and Trail Access. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of Big Ideas Math Resources for grades 7 and 8 as presented? Second. By Jim, second by Zach. Questions or discussion? Any other questions or comments? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Our seventh action item is the approval of the spin bike bid contract, Mr. Keeley. Thank you. At the February 26th committee meeting, the Buildings and Grounds Committee, uh, among other things, uh, reviewed the need to replace our existing spin bikes. Uh, the timing of the replacement actually co coincides with our summer construction in that area. Uh, so it will work out uh, quite nicely to replace those bikes at the same time uh, as the space is renovated and our students will return to uh, you know, new equipment and space. Uh, we put it out to public bid. Um, the results are there in the document. Uh, the, the low bidder um, was Heartline Fitness. Uh, they are a dealer rep for Kaiser. Uh, that's a manufacturer. It's, it's uh, actually the uh, manufacturer of the spin bikes that we had one version ago. We actually happen to have one of those bikes still in service. Uh, certainly a testament to the quality um, of those bikes um is that you know that longevity that we're seeing there so certainly in concert with uh miss purse the principal and mr wajda the department chair of pe um our team met with them we we talked about various options uh because we, we do know that this is a significant um, investment by the district and we want to make sure we have the right item uh, because our students are relying on this and those are going to be used all day every day as the the current space is uh, we did have several uh, vendors approach us after the bid was published, uh, seeking uh, an allowance for an alternate product. Uh, I believe it was five different manufacturers. Uh, Mr. Wajda uh, did some significant research on that, collaborated with other PE directors in the county. And in the end, uh, we weren't comfortable with, with uh, the quality, the warranty, et cetera, of any of those items. Um, and therefore, um, we stuck with that Kaiser bike. So what I have before you is uh, the recommendation for the purchase of uh, 41 Kaiser M3i spin bikes and the trade-in of, of our existing 40 Schwinn spin bikes with a total cost of $63,750. Is there a motion to approve the spin bike bid contract as presented? So moved. What's the warranty on these bikes? Do you know offhand? Because I know when we had the M3i uh, that we purchased in 2007, we had a three year warranty. Um, and I think those lasted seven years. These, I believe, this last batch only lasted, no, well, actually, it lasted nine years. Four years. No, like four years. The first, yeah, the first batch was the. Uh, the M3 I Kaiser spin bikes. Um, and this last patch of Schwinn, which I currently own a Schwinn, and I love my Schwinn, uh, only lasts four years. So um, I'm hoping, and I'm not going to hold you to it, but if we get a similar warranty out of it, that's all. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I should have noticed the difference because it's not as big as the kind of warranty we're getting out of it. Yeah. So there's a, a 10 year structural warranty for Kaiser, and then there's a three year on uh, essentially movable parts. Um, you know, one of the things we discussed with our B and G committee um, uh, in the winter was the fact that we do have this equipment 
um, but we don't have necessarily uh, a preventive maintenance schedule. We talk about that with with a lot of things, whether it be our our physical plant or our equipment. So we did uh, bring in a third party to do some maintenance um, on our uh, PE equipment. Uh, in fact, just recently, I don't wanna get on a tangent with you too much, but uh, all of our playgrounds were inspected um, by a third party licensed. We now have the report and now on a monthly basis, the facilities department is doing a physical check of all of them. Um, this is essentially um, at the behest of our new property casualty insurance company. It's in best practice, right? Um, so the good news is with these, even with that warranty, we are doing an annual preventive maintenance, um, which I think is really gonna do a lot um, uh, for the longevity of those. Um, the other reality is the physical space has increased in size. So we're gonna have the same number of bikes in a much larger space. Um, if you were in the old spin room, that last row of students were actually right up against the wall. So those uh, bikes were really jammed in there. They're, you know, up against each other, et cetera. So anyway, um, that's the long story uh, for a short answer, for a short question. We received one formal bid. As I mentioned, we had five vendors reach out, five different manufacturers asking to be included. And in the end, even though um, economically speaking, they were in the same ballpark, um, the quality just wasn't there. And, and one thing we've learned from our last go around with this is, you know, the folks that are using this the most, the folks that are teaching in that area, we, we really have to let them um, give their expertise on it. And um, uh, they're very pleased with the Kaiser product. You know, a board spin class in there, maybe. I got a question, Tim. Was wasn't there um, wasn't there some bikes recently, like maybe in the last year, that we replaced or did, or was am I confusing with something else? We were in litigation a couple of years ago yeah. with with the bike. Yeah. Is this the same room we're talking yes. about here? Yeah. Okay, so we're replacing these bikes that are in this room. Okay. Correct. You are correct. And we're aligning the replacement with the construction project because that room is being totally redone with the construction project. Okay. You know, it's one of the challenges you have um, with the dis you know, a, a distribution model from a manufacturer uh, with athletic uniforms. We run into that as well. Um, you know, we run into that with uh, technology. You know, we have to actually make a formal request to the manufacturers um, that nobody registers the deal, so to speak, so that uh, it is a fair uh, process. So we, we kind of took the same route as we do with our technology, um, where we, we do have a very good idea. The end user, the, the, in the case of technology, Mr. Kuko and his staff or um, the technology committees, et cetera, they know what they're looking for, but we still put it out with generic specifications because to ensure that competition um, we've got to have multiple uh, uh, vendors. And in this case, we were very clear from the get-go that we would consider alternatives. And, and we had, like I said, five others that reached out. So um, in our mind, from a procurement standpoint, um, Heartline Fitness was the only bidder on, on the Kaiser product, but they didn't know when they uh, submitted their bid whether they were the only bidder um, for the district. Yeah, Does that know. make sense? Yeah. And the last time we purchased the Kaiser bikes, there were three bidders. So who knows why the others didn't want to bid it. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, or frustrations? <laughs> Roll call, please. Ruffalo? Yes. 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 Williams? Yes. Daniel? Yes. 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 Motion approved. Our eighth action item is the approval of the consolidated district plan for 2021. So as you know, the Illinois State Board of Education requires that all boards of education uh, review and approve the consolidated district plan in order to be eligible to receive federal title grant funds. So that plan as uh, put together by Ms. Cartman is in your packet and I recommend it as presented. Is there a motion to approve the consolidated district plan for 2021 as presented? Second. Motion by Jim, second by Serge. Questions and discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. Williams? Yes. Daniels? Yes. Yes. Blaine? Yes. 
motion approved. Our final action item for this evening is the waiver of the second reading and then approval of the board policy updates. So included in your packet, thank you to the policy committee for reviewing uh, press plus issue number 103 and recommending the following policies be changed. So uh, two colon 160 and seven colon 70 are amended. There are no changes, uh, but updated uh, uh, legal references for four colon 50, six colon 280, seven colon 130, seven colon 325, and eight colon 80. Uh, policy exhibits two colon 125, exhibit one, and five colon 60, exhibit one, are uh, rewritten. And then additions to policies two colon 125, five colon 60, six colon 135, eight colon 10, eight colon 30, and eight colon 110. And then there are legal requirement changes to two colon 125, five colon 60, and eight colon 30. And then there's also a legal reference updates to five colon 150, five colon 280, six colon 135. I recommend all of these policy changes as presented by the policy committee are approved. Is there a motion to waive the second reading and approve the board policy updates as presented? So moved. Second. Motion by Serge, second by Chair Mayak. Questions or discussion? Please. Williams? Yes. 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 Motion approved. We are now down to discussion items. Superintendent Larkin. Yes, sir. Please remember that the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education is for Wednesday, June 26, 2020. So that's a month from now. Uh, please know that um, just like this meeting, the Board of Education will make a decision about the time, location, and format for that meeting based on the circumstances. Uh, also, please uh, remember that tomorrow night, our Indian Trail eighth graders um, will be celebrated through the virtual promotional exercise. I did send a link to that um, to all of our board members and all of our families of our eighth grade graduates have received that as well. And also, please remember that the last day of school, technically for students, is this Friday, May 29th. And also that is the last day for our teachers. And then Mr. Warman asked that I share an enrollment update with you. And I'm actually gonna read this, it's gonna be simpler. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he is pleased to announce that the online registration for 2021 school year has gone very well, despite uh, us not being in session. Although the early registration discount is over, we are still communicating with our families to have them complete the registration process for next year. As of today, we're excited to announce that the Early Learning Center has 77% of their students registered, Ardmore has 70%, Army Trail 64%, Fullerton 69%, Indian Trail 66%, Lake Park 93%, Lincoln 62%, and Stone 76%. Um, and then finally, Wesley is right around 70%. I have to share with you that in all my years, um, that's probably the best position that we're in at this time of the year. I can't explain, um, but that is good news. So again, our office staff will continue to reach out to families during the month of June to encourage and assist them with registering. Uh, Mr. Wartman does have meetings with our school secretaries. Um, certainly school registration is one of the topics that they review. And I know that they're meeting this next week to take the next steps. Uh, he also wanted to share the club activity summary for the year. So even though we were not in session for the last few months, he did get um, all of our club activity sponsors to complete the update form that's included in your packet. I would like to thank all of those staff who did contribute to those exciting activities and experiences for our children. Uh, Mr. Keeley, would you want to go through the construction project update and pictures or talk about it a little bit? Absolutely. Um, so as you see in your packet, uh, we did provide, um, we have ICI put together kind of a, a pictorial look at what's happened in the last month. Uh, each week, uh, we do provide a batch of photos to Ms. Janokas and she posts them to our website. 
So you're seeing you know, quite a few pictures updated from each of the two sites. In addition, we have our uh, live camera so that you can um, check on it at any time. I actually went by there today uh, and um, you know, the early learning center is progressing very nicely. They started putting uh, the exterior brick and exterior stone up on the um, what would be the north side of the building, and they're going to work their way counterclockwise around towards the um, towards the existing entrance on that. So um, the door uh, frames did show up actually yesterday, interior door frames. So they're installing those. Um, the rough plum plumbing is complete, and the roof at the Ardmore addition, um, as of a couple of days ago. I say a couple of days ago because every day um, they get a little bit further. But as of uh, earlier this week, they're at 90% completion. Um, Indian Trail, um, the boardroom walls have been framed uh, and rough electric is about 50% complete. Duck work has started and uh, uh, they've started some demo for the exterior canopy work. Um, it's really something to walk through that space. Uh, we were in there last week with Mr. Langton and uh, where there's about a group of uh, eight of us all wearing our, you know, obviously our, our hard hats, our high visibility uh, vests and our personal protective equipment. Um, but there were, like I said, there were seven or eight of us in that group and boy, it felt small. We knew we were in the existing boardroom, the walls were gone, but we knew the demarcation. And then we we're looking at what the new boardroom um, would look like. And it's certainly um, quite the expansion. So it's really exciting um, as far as professional development and day-to-day -day use to have that, that much needed meeting sp uh, space for our staff. And then obviously for our formal board meetings. Um, and then uh, obviously, the, uh, uh, the, the FACTS lab, the Family and Consumer Science Lab is coming together. All that plumbing is in and, um, you know, it's just, it's something to watch this go from schematic to, to reality. And um, it is unfortunate we're in the situation we're in. Otherwise, um, you know, we'd be showing it off to the board uh, more readily. Um, certainly, hopefully next month before the board meeting. Uh, we'll have a little bit more leeway in terms of social distancing, and perhaps we can take the board um, through some of the spaces. Uh, at this point, again, as I said earlier in the meeting, um, ICI is not admitting to being anything but on schedule, um, but we're, we're very um, pleased with where the project is at this point. Um, there are a couple long lead time items, um, such as windows, uh, that are, you know, kind of um, getting bogged down in the manufacturing process. And so ICI is being very careful to document everything so that when it comes time for the Buildings and Grounds Committee to ask us uh, why certain things are the way they are, we can we know that things were ordered, you know, in January and February when they should have been. And there's some things out of their control, but we're still cautiously optimistic about those substantial completion dates so that the building can be delivered back to um, uh, the students and staff of those buildings. Are there any questions uh, about any of the work to date? Um, it's not a construction question, but did we uh, select a provider for the classrooms that are going to be in the courtroom yet? A, a supplier? Yes, yes. So that's already been accounted for. Um, yes, absolutely. And does that tie in with the ones that we you know, I'm not really sure. You're talking about the ones that Dr. Losi demoed. Uh, I'll have to yield to Mr. Langton on that. Yeah, and I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure what the manufacturers are the one are going to be in the boardroom. I can tell you that when after we had viewed those, and then we said, hey, it would be nice if they were all the same. I was told that those were already ordered, and so it, I'm not sure if they're the same brand or not. I know that she did get one of the ones that's for piloting she did get it actually just came in this week any other questions what else we have two other right. items under a discussion the first one or the seventh discussion item is the annual uh, addison medina shriners parade just wanted to uh, formally let you know if you hadn't already heard that uh, even though it's at the end of august the village canceled that event already and then the other one, uh, the other event that's really up in the air is the joint annual conference, and that takes place in November. So uh, Carolyn and I are watching that closely just to see uh, when registration opens up, et cetera. We do have a, a, one of our uh, a groups, our instructional specialists are gonna be presenting at that conference. So hopefully even if they modify it or make it not in person, if it's virtual, hopefully we'll still be able to participate in some way. 
but I'll give you information once we know more. Okay. And that is all that we have, Mr. Williams. Okay, I have received to Blue District Four Board of Education provides an opportunity for the board to enter at each open meeting for comments from the public in accordance with board policy 2.30 in order to protect the rights of students, staff, or other individuals. Any item of a sensitive nature should not be presented in public, but should be communicated in writing to the district compliant manager. Board policy 2.230 states that members of the public shall be permitted to make comments to the board at each open meeting, ordinarily subject to the following time limitations. 30 minutes overall, 15 minutes per topic, three minutes per speaker. Generally, the Board of Education does not engage in dialogue during the public comments. Uh, the first uh, blue card, um, Superintendent Langton will uh, address that one? I'd be happy to. So uh, we were actually notified in advance by uh, Casey uh, Isuski, and I apologize, Casey, if I mispronounced your last name. She is a student uh, student series manager for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And she reached out to the board uh, really to say thank you to all of our students and their hard work. Several of our staff have uh, contributed to efforts to raise money for the Pennies for Patients program. Uh, so in front of each of you, Casey provided us with kind of an overview sheet. And I had also uh, sent you some information earlier this week um, that Casey had forwarded us. So I wanted to, I want to thank Casey for acknowledging the work, the hard work of our students. Um, but she reminded us that our school district has donated over $78,000 to the uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society mission, which is uh, purely amazing, $78,000. Uh, additionally, just this last fiscal year, we contributed $12,000. So uh, I'm really proud of our students. Um, many of our staff members across different schools have contributed to this effort and our, and our hats off to them. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, second blue card is uh, from Tina Siskoff, the yes. students at Stone and Indian Trail. Uh, it's in reference to uh, the board policy on public participation 2.230, which I've read the majority of that, which is on the card. So I'll start with a comment uh, that she has and then get into the questions here. Uh, the comment is public participation has gone from the total allowance 30 minute minimum to 30 minute maximum with a cap at 15 minutes per subject. Question, what happens when, if more blue cards are collected than the maximum time allowance? Will the board president be forced to extend the time to make sure all taxpayers are heard? If so, can the rule be modified and state that all collected cards will be addressed ignoring the following time limits? Um, it's at the board's discretion whether or not to, or at the board president's discretion whether to extend that time. And it would have to be strictly on whatever the situation was at the time. Uh, we don't anticipate that we'd be changing the board uh, policy at this time. Policy will remain as is. Um, and that pretty much answers those questions, I believe. Okay. Is Mr. Williams, I have one thing that I want to just correct, and I apologize <laughs> for this error. Um, I noticed that. Um, under our next board meeting information, which was the first discussion item, I accidentally put in here that it, it's uh, Wednesday, June 26th. It's actually Wednesday, June 24th, just so you know. And that'll be, obviously, we'll double check our website just to make sure that that's correct. That is all. Is there any miscellaneous or unfinished business to bring before the board? Is there 